Uh, what we're going to talk about is the Earth and Air electric car, um, which was a playtime project that started about three and a half years ago. Uh, I actually wish I could claim a lot more credit for it, uh, but it was actually uh, my father who did all of the design, and I was just more grunt work, cobbling the whole thing together. Um, and I, I always tell my people that, that my dad, when they ask what he does, I said, well, he's, he, what he does for a living is he builds high power transmission systems. Um, but what he does on the side is, is he's very much a do-it-yourself enthusiast. And when I say an enthusiast, um, people come to him for custom transmissions, high-power transmission systems all the time. So if they have some sort of oddball project, they come to him. Um, so as an example, National Fermi Laboratories, when they were doing their uh, particle collider, they came to him for the high-power transmission system to, to run the whole thing. So when he comes to me and says, well, uh, I think hydroponic units are too expensive. I'd like to cobble together my own off of off-the-shelf stuff. I said, okay, that sounds good. Uh, I, 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 he was playing with some LED grow lights. He said, I, th I think I'd like to go ahead and create a circuit board so they don't have to surface mount them and I can go ahead and solder them all in. So project after project wound up uh, over the years, all these playtime projects, and the electric car was one of them. So when he, he came up to me and said, I think I'd like to try building an electric car, it really didn't surprise me terribly. Um, who it did surprise uh, were the people that actually went to do the inspection. And this is actually what they said when, when, when we, he, he opened up the, the engine and was looking at the back. Um, and uh, not to, I don't want to, anybody to disparage Kentucky because uh, it is my home state. And uh, in, uh, in their defense, we had actually built the electric car before any of them became commercially available. And the inspector certainly wasn't the only one who had expressed a bit of surprise. So when we went to register the car, uh, we had to talk to the, the local DMV. And it went back and forth for weeks, from the local DMV to the Frankfurt office and back and forth, trying to figure out what exactly to do with our car. Um, because they had no classification for electrical cars at that point. So they were trying to find a way to fit into their system what our car was. So, so uh, we had received a call from, from the lady at the local DMV office. She said, um, do you think that we could consider this a rotary engine? And I said, well, it, it goes round and round, uh, so sure. She said, well, how many cylinders does it have? Uh, zero. <laughs> she said, well, let me see if it takes it. So yes, we are registered in the state of Kentucky as a rotary engine with zero cylinders. I'm pretty sure we're the only car in the state of Kentucky with that registration. Okay. So why, why did we build an electric car in the first place? Um, obviously, it's, it's a benefit to have a, uh, be able to power it with a renewable energy source. We had already been playing around with, with uh, solar panels anyway. Uh, we, we were using it to, to run some of the hydroponic units that we had built. We, had just, we were just playing around with it to, to, to see what it could do. Um, so it's always nice to have a renewable energy source. And uh, I'm cheap. I don't like to pay for gas. So it's, it's nice to be able to go back and forth without having to pay for that. <laughs> Um, obviously, you, you don't have the pollution that's associated with, with the gas and the diesel. Um, and it's also more efficient, and it's just one of the things that's not often talked about. So in, in order to, to highlight this and demonstrate this, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the first hybrids. They would be trains. In the 1960s, um, they had hybrid trains. So, so why is it that they, that they had hybrid trains? It's because they can actually handle the load more efficiently. They have a lot more power because you, you know, torque is, is not, it's not so much of a, of a limiting factor. You, you, they're, they're much more efficient at pulling the entire load. And that's why they, they started going in, into the, the hybrid. So to, to give an, another example of this, I'm, I'm going to show this. This is a diagram of, of an internal combustion engine. And, and what, what, what typically happens is, uh, well, there we go. I have a pointer and it's not showing. OK. <laughs> OK, too close. OK, the gas, the gas comes in one side. Um, you, you go ahead and it compresses. Uh, it combusts, internal combustion engine. That's where you get your energy from, and then you get the exhaust. Um, you're, all, you're limited by the amount of gas that you can push in. Um, and th then you're limited by the amount of energy that it can produce. So that's where, where the torque comes in because you're needing that, that additional leverage, and, and especially when you're first starting. So if, if you're sitting behind a, a big diesel truck, when it first starts, it's spewing out lots of black smoke. And the reason it's doing that is because it's, it's really inefficient. And that's where the, the gear shifts are, are, are coming in. 
Um, like like the, the electric car that we had, um, you know, especially because we were just going back and forth to work and, and we weren't really driving at any large distances. You know, it can only go 20 miles because we went with a really, really cheap batteries and didn't want to spend thousands of dollars on, on, uh, on better batteries. So it, it, we had just left that in second gear and we were just going back and forth because it had, uh, it had great starting torque. Okay, so we're going to talk about the, the decision process and, and why we chose the motor that, that we did. Uh, first, we're, we're going to go and talk about a simple, uh, simple equation. Uh, power in watts is uh, equal to, to volt times uh, the current in, in amps. So if you go up in the voltage, you don't need as much current. Uh, and current's going to dictate things like wire size. Um, so what we're trying to do is go up as high as we could uh, in the voltage so the current wasn't a limiting factor. So uh, the biggest thing in our motor criteria was we wanted the highest amount of power for the lightest weight. So well, when we looked at the engines, we found uh, a permanent magnet motor, perm motor, uh, that we had gotten from Germany. And the reason that, that we, we chose that one was several. First is that it was really lightweight. And if you actually look in, in, in the electric car, which is right there, it, it's, it's very tiny, very tiny, very lightweight, uh, 74 volt performance. It's same as the E-Tech, um, but it also had 40% higher torque constant, 120% more stall torque, and 50% higher uh, peak uh, power output. So then we went to, to choose a frame, and we went through several iterations of this. The first one was a go-kart because we just wanted to test it out. We wanted to go ahead and piece things together. So you know, we had a 24-volt battery pack, a very cheap controller, and we cobbled together a go-kart and we would whiz around the parking lot. We just wanted to, to show that, yes, indeed, we, we could do this. Uh, the next one that, that we went with was, was a, a midget race car, and it had a, uh, uh, had a frame that, that we could work, work with. Like a, uh, and uh, we went ahead and upped the amount of battery, so we went with uh, the 72-volt uh, battery pack. And you can see right at the start, at the back of it, um, we already have the perm motor. So uh, uh, this, this is the car that, that was really the testing grounds for the next phase, for when we actually wanted to put it into a you know, more uh, roadworthy car chassis, because uh, something tells me that they, they wouldn't be very fond of, of giving us approval for a, a midget race car chassis driving around. So the very next one that we went with was a DeLorean. Um, and I, and I, there, there are actually are reasons that we chose this. And I, I think the biggest one was probably that my father had watched too many episodes of Back to the Future. <laughs> I can't think of any other really good reason why we had gotten the DeLorean. Um, but uh, the, the DeLorean was indeed cheap. Um, uh, it, it is, what, what was the declaration that had de, de, uh, been declared as? Uh, El Salvage, yes. <laughs> um, so it was very cheap, um, and it also had the, the, the uh, Volkswagen Bug frame. It was something that he was familiar with because when he was, when he was a teenager, he had completely uh, taken apart his Volkswagen Bug, so it, it, he had that familiarity with it, so that helped. Uh, the downside was is, uh, that it was too cheap. <laughs> it would have declared it salvage, and, and anybody who has tried to get the car registered and licensed after it's been declared salvage. It's like, you know, they, they set up several uh, burning, flaming uh, rings that you have to jump through in order to actually get it uh, declared roadworthy again. So we wound up completely scrapping the DeLorean and finally settled on the Fraser Nash car kit. And the reason that we chose the Fraser Nash car kit, the first is that it's lightweight. Uh, it's a fiberglass body, so it's very, very lightweight. Um, and, and, and in terms of the lightweight, it, it had the same criteria as the motor. You, but we want both the motor and, the, and the, the frame itself to be more lightweight. You're going to get a much further distance on that. It, it also had the, the VW bug frame. Uh, cost, of course, was a factor once again. And in this case, we made sure that it had a good, clear title. It had already been driven around on the road, so <laughs> we had no worries about that. So then, then we went ahead and, and picked uh, the batteries. Uh, we, we went with as cheap a, a, as we could, but, but still uh, we did go with some of the, the uh, deep cycle uh, batteries. Uh, and, and mainly because um, uh, we could guarantee that if we had a huge current draw, it wouldn't warp the battery plates. Um, so we went ahead and uh, put some in the front. And then we also put uh, some in the bat back over the rear axle, which uh, which I believe was, was the original place that the motor was anyway. Yeah. Right. Um, 
And putting them both in front and back also happened to, it helped balance it out quite a bit uh, because you have a lot of weight in one place or another, so having it both front and back was helpful. And I'm sorry I didn't take a photo of this <laughs> ahead of time, but we, we actually did use an off-the-shelf uh, Altrax controller. Uh, we've, uh, there are do-it-yourself kits. In, in fact, the last Mother Earth News Fair at Puyallup, uh, we had caught uh, one of the other workshops uh, where they had, they had actually talked about a do-it-yourself controller that they had done. So there are a lot of cheaper ways to do this, and uh, in some cases we just went ahead and, and bought new and off-the-shelf product. Okay, so some, some general info on, on the whole product. Okay. Uh, the mileage is 15 to 20 miles. Uh, as I said, it's, 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 not, a, it's not a long distance. Um, we were just looking for it as, as to replace a vehicle for a back and forth to work. And, uh, and we very much accomplished that. They, they, uh, work is about five miles away. Uh, so we got several trips back and forth, at least one and a half back and forth. And we would just plug it into, it. when we drive to work, we had the solar, solar ray on top. We would just go ahead and, and charge it that way. Uh, charging, solar panels. Uh, okay, that's wrong. It's 120, foot, 120 uh, volt AC. And here are all the costs, which are actually uh, fairly pricey when, when you com compare them with somebody like, uh, like Ben there, who uh, was able to do it for $1,300. <laughs> so, but we went ahead and we had a, a more expensive motor. that we, we, we did spend a little bit more money on the car you know, for the familiarity of the v, VW Bug frame and, and the more lightweight. Uh, like I said, we, we paid for the controller, the wiring, and the batteries were all new. And you, uh, I, I believe what Ben had done is he had gotten used batteries as well. So there are ways to cut this, the, these costs down substantially. Okay, uh, I went ahead and plugged in some numbers for savings uh, because uh, up to the point that I actually knew that we were going to be giving a presentation, um, I had actually asked uh, Mother of News if they'd be interested if we had shown the electric car, and, and so we got to talking, and they said, would you be interested in the presentation? And I said, sure. So we started cobbling together some numbers and to, to get an actual estimate on what we saved. Um, so I, I estimated uh, about 260 work days uh, back and forth. Now that's assuming that it's, that it's absolutely clear weather. Because if, if you've seen the car, uh, it, it has a little manual windshield wiper, so it's not a lot of fun driving it back and forth, doing the windshield wiper while you're driving and it's raining. So on rainy days, it stayed at home. <laughs> but uh, the round trip uh, was 10.96 miles. Um, so if, if we're going to assume if it were a gas car, uh, let's say an average 30 miles uh, per gallon, uh, and I took an average of $2.61 a gallon. I just went ahead and took the average gas price over two years, and I shot for somewhere in the middle. So, uh, you know, if you ask yourself the, pr the direction that you feel gas is going, I'm pretty sure it's going to be a lot higher than $2.61 a gallon going forward. So our price savings per year wound up being, uh, or I'm sorry, the price if you were to, to, to spend gas just to go back and forth uh, five miles was $248.57. So the, the electric, um, because we have the two battery packs, four kilowatts each, um, eight kilowatts at uh, seven cents per kilowatt hour. Um, so that was uh, for 56 cents for a full charge. And we assume 1.5 round trips on a charge. That wound up being $97.06 if we were paying for the electric, which we didn't because we had, a sol we had solar panels. Uh, but obviously the solar panels are expensive. So I'm just going to give you the, the cost if we had just plugged it in. So what we wound up saving was $151.51 .51 each year. Um, now, this doesn't seem, whoa, <laughs> this doesn't seem like a whole lot. But what I wanted to stress on it was uh, if you go ahead and look at, at it as a percentage, it's a lot more significant. Um, and this shows the difference between a, a electric and gas. Uh, 39 cents more it's costing us to drive a gas car than an electric. Okay, so I'm going to talk about where we're taking this next. So our, our next, pro this was our first project that we had done um, two and a half years ago at this point. It had started maybe three, three and a half years. Um, this is actually a, a, an AC induction motor. And uh, the reason that, that we're, we're going with, with AC are, are numerous. Okay, Th this right here is, is, is a DC motor. Um, okay, and DC motors typically have uh, brushes or, or commutators. Um, the AC motor, and this is a diagram of the AC motor, uh, the AC motor changes on, uh, on polarity and it actually, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, a wave 
so you have the, the uh, intrinsically the plus and minus. Um, you actually, it, it, as I said, it naturally implies motion. So, so, so you have two things. One is, is the, uh, the DC motor is a little bit more uh, mechanical in nature, where the AC motor, uh, because it's following a waveform, uh, it naturally implies motion. And, and if, if you look into some of the work of that, that Tesla had done, he proved the reason, some of the reasons why in his early research um, why AC is, is better than DC in terms of motion. Um, so as, aside from just from that point, it's also since we were, we were talking about the brushes, uh, the brushes in a, in a DC motor, um, you're, you're going to have a lot more uh, wear and tear on it. So you're going to have more maintenance. You know, the, uh, the brushes, brushes have more friction. Uh, you're getting arcing. Um, and in the case of an, of an AC motor, you just have the ball bearings, which have a, a lot less friction involved. So, so you have two things. The AC motor is, 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 is better for motion, and it's also you're going to have a lot less maintenance that's going to be involved with it. Now we're going to we're talk about a little bit about the future of electric vehicles, because I, I think this is, this is an important part of the discussion, because um, obviously we're just using the car to drive back and forth to work. Um, not everybody is, would, want, would want to cobble uh, an electric vehicle together just to go back and forth to work. And some of us have to drive a lot further distances uh, back and forth. Um, so I think there are some important things that have to happen, even with the commercial vehicles uh, that are coming off the line, uh, in order for, for a change to happen. But with, one is going to have to gonna be infrastructure. Uh, because right now we have an infrastructure that, that supports gas, and you have pumping stations all along the way. It's very quick to pump your car. Um, charging the car, not so much. Um, but the infrastructure definitely has to be there to support the electric vehicle. Um, but I, and this, this seems like a, a tall order, but I wanted to give another example. So in, in 1900, um, there were 20 million horses, uh, about 4,000 cars in the United States. And urban planners were dealing with horse pollution. So uh, it's essentially them urinating everywhere and, and uh, having, uh, you know, dumping everywhere. Uh, so if, if you wanted to fill up those few 4,000 who actually had a, a, a gas car, had a car, um, they had to drive to the, their local uh, general store or a kerosene refinery with a bucket to get what they needed. So uh, at that point, there was no infrastructure for gas. The thing that I'm trying to highlight is these, these, thing, these changes can happen and they are going to happen um, for a lot of reasons because gas prices are going up. Um, because the, the electric cars are simply more efficient, are going to last longer, there's less pollution. These, these changes are going to happen, um, and then they will happen to the infrastructure. Uh, it also has to happen for innovation. Um, we t I talked about charging times. It's, 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 it takes a, a, long, a longer time to charge a battery. You, you're used to just going to the pump and filling up very quickly. Um, so there are things that, are come, that they're, they're researching, uh, things like supercapacitors uh, or charged sludge, the, the pre-charged electrolytes that you just pump in very quickly. Um, these will all facilitate a, a battery that, that you can just go to a charging station and you'll be able to charge very quickly. Um, and and in, in some cases, it'll probably be a lot faster than actually gas. Um, the other thing that is, is the battery charge. I mentioned the, the, the batteries that, that we had used. Um, if we had wanted to spend thousands of you know, many thousands of dollars, we could have put in uh, much better batteries. We could have gotten 100 miles out of it if we wanted to. But, but even beyond that, even 100 miles, you know, we, we, we can extend this a lot further. Um, so the battery charge, that there's a lot of research going on to, to get a, a higher density, uh, so a higher amount of energy in a much more lightweight battery because that's, that's essentially what we're going to need to get to. So there's a lot of research going on in exotic metals and electrolyte uh, uh, combinations. Uh, there's some research uh, going on with, with, with nanoparticles and giving a lot more uh, surface area to, to hold the charge. Um, okay, uh, I'm not sure how we are in time, but I did want to be able to pass it over for questions because there, there are probably going to be a lot of questions as to, to how all of this is done and very specific questions on how you can do it uh, for your own electric vehicle project. What we plan on doing after this, uh, after this whole fair is I, I, I went ahead and created a page on Earth and Ear for, uh, for the electric car. It's just a holder space right now until we get back. And what we'll wind up doing is we'll, we'll put up any in images we have, uh, any texts and the, uh, uh, the presentation from this workshop, 
And we'll, uh, as we're going along on our next project, which is the AC induction motor, we'll go ahead and post any text, um, any images, and you can follow along as we're doing it. Um, the, the next one is going to, because it's an, an AC induction motor and it's three phase, it's also going to be, uh, we're going to be programming IGBTs as well. So um, and any of the code that I write, I'm going to be writing the, the code for the I, I, IGBTs. Uh, any code that I write, I'll go ahead and make it open source so that anybody can, can look around and, and play around with it if they want to. But I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to questions because I'm sure there'll be a lot of them. Good. We don't have any, so I can Okay, go ahead. Um, when you say AC, are you talking of permanent maintenance, like um, AC servo? Or very, very similar to an AC servo, yes. That there is indeed a uh, 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 permanent magnet involved. Uh, and then you know your, your stator rotor, which is so changing you, with with the AC waveform. Are you going to be using um, what commutation are you going to be using? Are you going to use like an encoder to? to um, or are you going to just use a simple seven step? Or it's a good question. Uh, we, we're going to be getting into some of that, and the motor itself doesn't. Uh, I don't know if you saw the one slide, but the the AC induction motor that we're getting. Uh, or already have is it, kind of unique. It was actually from a project that Ford had started for electric vehicles and then shut down the project. So Siemens in Germany was stuck with all of these electric motors that were originally made for an electric vehicle. And uh, it does have uh, various sensing already on the motor, so we'll be able to, to use some of that sensing in terms of the uh, speed rotation and everything else back into the program so that we can uh, you know, complete the loop. Uh, I don't want to get overly technical about this because uh, uh, I don't think there's probably a lot of interest in it, but we are indeed looking at the IGBT switching, uh, zero voltage switching points, and then uh, phase correction. No, we're probably going to have a, the AC doesn't lend itself well as well to regenerative braking as DC does. So that is going to be a bit of an issue. And uh, obviously from the first go, we're not even be concerned with the regenerative braking or, or any way of recovering some of it uh, until we get the programming correct for the AC motor. Uh, we will. <laughs> I was actually told I should just stand here and say, I don't know, I, but I like batteries. <laughs> yes? You spoke about charging the batteries with solar. Yes. Uh, one of the things I've been interested in, maybe you pursued it, is uh, putting a, a turbine in front. So as you're going through or down the road, the wind is going through the fan, generating electricity to recharge the batteries while driving. We, we've actually thought about that a little bit. That is an interesting possibility uh, of using, you know, the, the wind going around you as you're, you're coming back and, and using that to try to regen a little bit of, of the energy that you're expending. And uh, it, that would be an interesting one to, to approach. Uh, we were asked if it would be worthwhile to put, you know, like a, a basic generator back on each wheel. But th there's... <laughs> Perpetual motion does not exist yet. So it, it really doesn't make any sense to go that route. But, but to go this, the route of the wind going by you, that would be an interesting one, very interesting. Guess that's it. Oh, OK. Oh, gee. <laughs> go ahead, please. Uh, would we like one, or? <laughs> Well, uh, I know it will not be the Fraser net. Okay. I'm not fond of the, the rainy days. Yeah. I think he's going to volunteer his car. <laughs> Actually, I, I honestly was, yeah, I was thinking about seeing if, if we could get a, a truck because that was one of the things that, that always interested me about electric cars. And since we're talking about a shorter range anyway, 
is that it lends itself really well to farm vehicles uh, and, and trucks in particular because you're, you're really close to where you're charging because it's at your house. Right, right. Um, so it makes a lot of sense to me. So that may be the next step if we can find something that's you know that's a little more lightweight. Do you have a problem with it? I know one of the, the uh, criteria that you want in choosing a donor car would be something that's small and lightweight, but then you have problems with, with is, the, is the weight of the battery Um, up, up to a point on some of that. Uh, you do have to be careful about that. Um, but, but the weight of the engine that you're taking out is also a, a factor. So uh, you, you do the, the equation kind of balances out before too long. But I mean, if you got really crazy with batteries, yeah. It, uh, <laughs> and, and I had mentioned that that was one of the benefits of having both the battery packs the front and the back is it did lend quite a bit of balance and made it <laughs> a little more comfortable. Um, but yeah, and, and again, as, as the battery technology increases and, and hopefully we'll get down to the range that I can actually purchase it, <laughs> um, you know, hopefully they're, they're going to be coming up with a lot lighter weights to extend the range anyway. Okay. Okay. Are you aware of that? I, I'm aware of, of some of that, not necessarily the one in Pittsburgh. And I guess that is something to add. Uh, there is a group uh, called Eco Modders online. Uh, ben, if you do, you need to correct me on that. It's that's, that's ecomodder.com. It's a very good platform. Uh, e C O M O D D E R. Correct. Was it an S on the end? Uh, no, just ecomodder.com. Ecomodder.com. I'd also recommend. Okay, uh, and that has been a really good forum of uh, folks and stuff who have been interested in electric vehicles and also interested in doing their own. And uh, there is quite a community of folks that are, are uh, doing their own electric vehicles in one form or another. Uh, ben will be making a presentation after ours, and he's obviously been doing a lot of that as well. Uh, but uh, you'll find a lot, who, a lot of enthusiasts who are willing to do homebrew kind of things. And uh, Dan had mentioned a little bit about a uh, presenter from uh, Mother Earth News Fair in Washington State. And that was Paul and Sabrina. They had uh, come up with a design for a controller. And they offered this controller out as a kit. So you can actually sit and uh, make your own controller rather than buying something off the shelf. So there is quite a community of uh, amateur type enthusiasts out there. It's very encouraging. Yeah, that's probably something else I should have mentioned. We actually did purchase that do-it-yourself oh, controller yeah. just so we could to play around with it. Yeah. And that, that do-it-yourself controller is going to be the next controller in that vehicle because uh, they can actually go up in voltage with their controller uh, to I think it was 144 volts is what you wound up using yours as. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually running that controller in my car and then on the uh, build your own electric car instructional there is information on the, uh, the open revolt controller, which uh, I, That's I, correct. Designed, I designed the t-shirt for the product. <laughs> <laughs> and I was the official test pilot on that one. We went up, got the car up to 73 and a 55 zone with uh, <laughs> <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> the speeding ticket incident is a fantastic story all by itself. <laughs> I mentioned that at 11 o'clock during the uh, electric motorcycle presentation. <laughs> Did you bring it with to display? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yes. It, in terms of the uh, the registration, or you said EPA, or uh, there at this point there was really nothing in terms of you know if I understood it right uh, EPA uh, Environmental Protection Agency is what you're. We certainly had nobody asking us about it or, you know, 
I mean, as you can see, the, the inspector didn't exactly know what to do with it. <laughs> so uh, uh, we, we certainly didn't get any questions from him. Yeah. Uh, that would be something interesting to find out is that, uh, you know, if various states have uh, much more uh, emission control testing, how they would handle that. Yeah, I, and, 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 and I will say in terms of, of the emission control, um, Kentucky's pretty lax. Uh, that there was a time when we had to take our cars in, I, and they stopped doing it. Um, so Kentucky is pretty lax. And, and when I started doing my initial work, I had to call up the state and tell them I wanted to get the cars back. They asked, well, where are you going to take it to so we can set our emissions there? And they said, okay. Yeah, see, it, it, it'll, it'll probably differ state to state, you know, based on the regulations and, and, and how to deal with it. It would be kind of interesting to watch them where they're going to put the, uh, the tailpipe emissions <laughs> testing, you know. <laughs> well, I can uh, definitely tell you where to put it. <laughs> At one point they asked me where my air pump was, and I said, what? They said, well, the said, you have to have it on there. And the guy told me, drill a hole there and put it on. And I said, no, I put it on. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Were tires modified to reduce weight? Were, were well, well, believe it or not, we, we selected some tires that were uh, the uh, low rolling resistance, specifically. Um, we didn't really make mention of that, but we definitely looked for tires and stuff that had the lower uh, rolling resistance. Uh, we, we looked at every aspect that we could to uh, try to make sure that we uh, you know, got into the most efficient operation we could. Yes, sir. No, the clutch is out, but we are then uh, direct driving the transmission itself. And, and we did leave the transmission in place. Um, uh, and, and leaving it in second was, was the, the, the most uh, optimum point for it because it has plenty of torque. So starting from second was not a problem, and we don't even use first gear at all. And it, within the second gear then, it got to typically a top speed of 45 miles an hour plus, and uh, for, for local driving and everything else, that was fine. Uh, but if we did feel that we did have to go higher, uh, we, we can indeed shift into the third, and that will indeed get us a little bit higher top end speed. But uh, <laughs> didn't use it all that often. You've got questions? Yeah, I, I want to know if um, we're going to focus our videos that you consulted before starting the project, or are there any you recommend? For, for our project? Uh, or uh, People who want to start, they want to build an electric car, but they don't know where to start. Do you have any resources you can point them to? Can I point directly to you? <laughs> He's got instructional DVDs all set to go about how to make these things, um, which is really, really great. And uh, Ben has been at some of this probably longer and has done a really good job with all of this uh, before. Uh, we were actually probably doing it probably about the same time, but we weren't very public about what we were doing. He's out there. He's very public with what he's doing. Yeah, but when, when we actually uh, asked if they'd be interested in us having the electric car here, uh, and I mentioned it to my dad, he said, so other people are actually interested in what I built? <laughs> yes, I think they will be. <laughs> uh, I was going to ask basically the same thing. A list of uh, suppliers or uh, resources? Yeah, what we can do, we'll go back on that. <clears throat> we, we'll go back on, uh, on some of this and, and come up with a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Part of the reason I was saying I was going to go ahead and put up a web page for it is because uh, we need to go back and, and figure out all the suppliers that we went to, through to do it in the first place. When we went through the whole project, I wish now that we had taken photos of, of each stage as we were building it because it would have been worthwhile. So we, we know for the second one, when we actually approach it to do the AC induction motor one, uh, we're going to include a lot more material just and make it available so that you can follow step by step and see what we've done and have all the resources. Of yeah, the I, I was told what my role is, though, in, in life. You're going to put me in a back room somewhere, <laughs> throw in some food every once in a while, see what yeah. comes out, and that was all I was supposed to do, you know? <laughs> yeah, you raise them, and this is what you get, you know? It's, yes, sir? Can you address battery technology? What's most practical and viable at this point in time? Um, 
Well, the, 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 the current state of the art that's out there is obviously is either the, the lithium ion or NICAD. Uh, and the lithium ion uh, probably more than, than anything else. Uh, the only thing is, though, is that they, there are some dangers involved with lithium ion, that they can indeed explode. You have to uh, definitely watch the charging curves. Um, the, they have specific chargers for the lithium ion uh, to control the charge curves and to keep them in within self, uh, good safe ranges. And it is an issue. But um, again, as Dan had pointed out, though, there are new technologies just coming on the horizon. And it's going to be interesting to see how this stuff sifts out and what becomes viable. Uh, the lithium ion, um, there are various people that roll these up into packs, and I'll have to go back and research some of the names on those. Uh, unfortunately, most of the major suppliers are uh, overseas. Uh, I think you guys will find this uh, kind of funny or interesting that uh, majority of the suppliers for any of these things, for the batteries, lithium ion or whatever, uh, they're considered hazardous industries and most of them are not here in the United States, they're in China. Yes? Yes, there have been people, uh, obviously, that there is a group of guys who uh, have electric uh, solar races, believe it or not. Uh, and a lot of them are sponsored by the universities. Uh, but part of the problem is, though, is that you do need a fairly large surface area of solar to generate enough power. So uh, a little bit of that technology has to come along as well. Uh, the flexible panels are interesting. They, they, they can definitely do the job. But uh, if you look at the total surface area that you have in a car, it's fairly small. I just thought any car, and not only that, if you guys are driving such a bad electric car that you built, you're driving it to work. Well, how many hours is it sitting in the parking lot and the sun is shining? Mm, yeah. Sure. Well, that's true, but it's also plugged in when it's on the sun is shining. For me, where I was driving to work, I was not allowed to plug it in. They were well, that, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm actually hoping that's one of the, the changes that does wow. take place, is that maybe more businesses... Uh, yeah. <laughs> and we've already started to, to see some of that. I guess that there are were various convenience stores, I guess up and toward Washington, Oregon area, that are yeah. now setting up uh, charging stations. Yeah, the, 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 whole, the whole West Coast is, is very active in, in creating uh, an area for charging stations. I forget what they call it, something, the Green Highway, or something like that. Yeah. And it. some of the big boys are looking at it very seriously, too. So that uh, GE, I guess, it has come up with designs for charging stations. I don't know, you know, it's always going to be a, a chicken and egg problem in all of this. You know, the vehicles have to be there, then they're going to set up some of the infrastructure, but the vehicles aren't going to come about unless some of the infrastructure is there. So it's going to be interesting to see how it does sift out. Yes, sir. How far away are we from eliminating the transmission altogether in favor of four drive motors on the field? We're definitely there. Uh, first off, with most electric vehicles, there really isn't much, uh, if they've done everything correctly, there is not going to be much in the way of transmission anyway, because the electric motor all by itself can take care of that full torque range, can do both, you know, the start torque and then at the high enough speed and uh, gears are eliminated. The uh, possibility of uh, direct wheel drive you know, for, for all four wheels is definitely there. And the biggest advance that's happened is microprocessors. And uh, with microprocessors and control, you can go ahead and, and read the speed off of all of them, get all of these things to work all together, and get the drivetrain to work properly. Um, we are definitely going to be into uh, some of the microprocessor, both control and then feedback uh, on the next stuff that we're going to be working on. But the, the, the technology is there. How about charging on the fly? 
Interesting, how do you do it? <laughs> I, I'm interested in what, what, what do we got? <laughs> yes, sir? You mentioned supercapacitors. Are there any out there? Yes. I, heard, I read about one a couple years ago, e store. Um, I, I can't tell you an exact manufacturer at this point. I can tell you one thing they're available on eBay. <laughs> Surprise me, too. Uh, 2.7 volts for $23, I think. And uh, I think it was uh, about a couple hundred uh, farad, fairly large. When I was reading about it, it was, you know, yeah. Well, the, yeah, the, these are individual cells, and you're going to have to do exactly the same thing you did with the batteries. Is, is go ahead and make a mess of them up in order to get a complete structure to get you, you know, 12 volt or whatever you want to operate on. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, we, we charge the batteries when they're still in the car. We do use an external uh, charger rather than, we, we didn't build the charger in, but we use an external charger and we can charge up the whole thing as a, as a group of 72 volt. Uh, we have a specific charger that has ability to click voltage ranges so we just charge it at 72 and it spreads the charging out to both packs and to all of the batteries in line. Uh, I did a research online uh, and, and found it. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head the actual manufacturer. I think we, we got one of the other ones from Schumacher, I believe was the manufacturer on one of them. And on, on this one, I guess what we'll have to do is, is go back, look it up, and we'll post it online. You again? Yeah, I, I, I just want to give a plug to the Mother Earth Fair bookstore that's inside. They actually do have a, a very good, nice, clean transportation section in there. They have a number of books and instructional DVDs. When I stopped uh, in there yesterday, I looked through it, I realized I had read every single book and seen every single DVD that they had there. And I actually can personally work on them. They're all, they're all very good. So I think they've got a, a very nice selection of information up there. So if somebody's considering building their own electric car, uh, the materials that they have at the bookstore are actually very good. So that's a, a great place for somebody to get started. OK. Um, I guess pretty much that's it. Uh, and to you guys that are all going down the same path and are trying your own stuff, best of luck to you. Thank mm -hmm. you.